All right, everyone. So today we're going to be talking about Poland and Ukraine. Just recently, the Prime Minister of Poland, Mateusz Morawiecki, wrote an article about uh, what needs to be done in order to remove the threat of Russia. And he says that the only way to do this is to treat Russia just as we treated Germany uh, after the Second World War just as there was a policy of denazification imposed upon Germany, so there must be a policy of de-Putinization um, imposed upon uh, Russia. Now, he does not specify the way that this should be done. He doesn't say that there needs to be a war or that Russia needs to be bombed. He just says that Russia needs to be de-Putinized. But he leaves us with a question. I mean, we are left asking how this should be done. Uh, because the only way that the Allies were able to efficiently denazify Germany to the best of their ability uh, was to first defeat Germany in a war. That was the only way the Allies uh, were able to do it. So really, the only way that you're going to de-Putinize Russia or you're going to remove uh, the, the, the Russian ideal of reviving its empire is to go to war. I mean, that's the implication that is conveyed in this article. How else would you do it? So really what Poland is pushing for, or really specifically what the Polish government is pushing for, because I don't think most Polish people want a war with Russia, but what the Polish government is pushing for here is a war. It's pushing for a war. And we saw a little bit of this when uh, uh, Yaroslav uh, Kaczynski uh, proposed the idea of putting a peacekeeping force in, uh, in Western Ukraine. And, uh, of course, this peacekeeping force would consist of Polish soldiers, but it would be under the superintendence of NATO, right? So it would be okay. Now, if there was a, a war to de-Putinize Russia, that, that would be World War III. There's no doubt about it. That it would be World War III. And it would be a nuclear war. And Poland would be one of the countries that would be suffering the most. Poland would be uh, engulfed in a violent conflict and the entire country would be devastated and uh, millions possibly would die. And uh, if there was a war with Russia, if there was a war to de-Putinize Russia or to remove the ideology of Russian world or the ideology of reviving Tsardom, um, Germany most definitely would get involved. Uh, Germany would revive its military, and uh, most definitely uh, Poland would be torn apart like meat in a grinder. Germany would be involved, Russia would be right there in Poland, and it would be like World War II all over again. Now, in Morawiecki's uh, article, he does state things that I agree with. Now, I'm trying to be fair here. Uh, years ago, I did a video about Poland's tension with Israel over Netanyahu calling the uh, the Nazi concentration camps in Poland uh, Polish death camps. And what Netanyahu did was absolutely uh, provocative and uncalled for. And uh, Morawiecki defended his country in that situation, and I fully expressed my agreement with Morawiecki. That was back in 2018, uh, when Polish people really liked me on YouTube, and now a lot of Polish people are upset with me. But 
there have been some great statements of support coming from Polish people um, to my YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, they've been expressing their, their agreement with me. And I greatly appreciate that because I'm glad to see that they are Polish people who definitely recognize the threat of Ukrainian nationalism. Um, a lot of Polish people have been uh, pushed or they've pushed themselves into this delusion that uh, the threat of Ukrainian nationalism or the, the reality of Ukrainian Banderite nationalism is just insignificant and that they should not worry about it. And the way that these Polish commenters write me is in a very vicious manner, and I assume that uh, they are in the age group of Zoomerism because that's how they write. Um, but they are things that Moriveski said in this article that I agree with, and I'm going to read them to you. So, for example, he says that the end of history was supposed to bring about an end to ideology. Thirty years ago, we fell into a blissful forgetfulness. The farther west one ventured, the easier it was to believe that the world would forever remain an oasis of peace. And I agree with this. There has been, since the end of the Second World War, there has been this illusion, uh, or I should say a delusion, that a lot of people uh, have been believing in for decades, and that is that we will never see a world war again. And my response to these people is that that's exactly what they believed after the First World War. They believed that this would never happen again, and that everything would be okay, and that's not what happened, and it did not take long before another world war sparked again, and that was the Second World War, as all of you know. Um, it's interesting uh, to point out that there was a, uh, a non-aggression agreement that was made between Poland and Germany before Germany invaded Poland. So that's my response to people, to Polish people, when they say, oh, yeah, there's an alliance between Ukraine and Poland, and we, we, we've just made a security pact together and a trade agreement and blah, 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 blah. It's like, listen, when it comes to ideology and going to war, all peace agreements go out the window. There were agreements that were made between Japan and the United States before the Second World War, and all those went out the window. So I don't really take these agreements uh, into serious consideration. But Mr. Modovieski is correct here when he says that the world has been taken has been taken by this idea that we will never see a world war again, and it's it's the whole world is inebriated by this idea. The whole world is intoxicated by this idea. But that's uh, quickly going to uh, dissipate. The farther west one ventured, the easier it was to believe that the world would forever remain an oasis of peace. I already read that. Meanwhile, in Moscow, work was underway to resurrect the demons of history. Today, the cursed phantoms of the 20th century was risen, have risen over uh, again over Ukraine. Now, I don't want to call Russia a demon, but what I will say is that the fact that Russia wants to retake territory that it used to control does tell us that we have entered an age of the revival of empires. This is a fact that I have been talking about for years. Uh, I'm not going to exempt Russia from this, but we see Turkey and Syria, North Africa, Iraq, uh, in the Mediterranean, in the, in the South Caucasus. It's like, well, yeah, we see Turkey trying to bring back its world power and trying to uh, reassert its position as a world superpower to be respected. Yep, we see Turkey doing that. We also see Russia reviving its empire as well. Uh, you know, Russia has said that the reason why they invaded uh, Ukraine is to denazify it, and it's to protect the ethnic Russians who live in the East. And I think, yeah, there's definitely truth to that. But ultimately, the real reason why Russia took Crimea was to retake territory that it used to control. I mean, it, that's not that it's not that difficult to believe. Um, countries will do this. Countries, once they get powerful enough, if they if they if they had a serious empire in the past, they will retake it. They will retake it. Uh, <laughs> makes you wonder about Russia and Alaska. Um, yeah, Russia's a lot closer to the U.S. than we think. Uh, yeah. But that's what these these countries that used to be superpowers would do once they get the opportunity. And Russia has had the opportunity. Um, you know, and I also think that the reason why Russia took Crimea is to get um, sort of like a preemptive advantage over Turkey in the Black Sea. 
So instead of Ukraine, which is not um, really an ally of Russia, obviously, um, and instead of Ukraine controlling Crimea, it would be Russia right there on the Black Sea across from Turkey. So I think that was just a it was sort of a preemptive strategy taken on the part of Russia against Turkey, because I believe it's quite obvious that there will be a, a conflict between Russia and Turkey in the future. Um, so Morawiecki is correct in the sense that we are seeing the age of empires return. We're seeing a revival of empires. Now, he says in, in the end, he says that the cursed phantoms of the 20th century have risen again over Ukraine. I would say that the demons uh, are in Ukraine, uh, but there, but he's not mentioning the demon here, uh, Banderism. He's not, he's not mentioning this because I thought, okay, the, yeah, Ukraine, sure. Ultranationalism is reviving in Ukraine. Absolutely. Banderism, um, re reverence for the OUN, reverence for the UPA, for the UPA. All of this is, is alive and well in Ukraine, especially in Western Ukraine. But he's not mentioning it here. So it's like, yes, the demons of the past are here. Now, he's trying to make it out that communism is here because Russia, the Soviet Union uh, uh, controlled Ukraine, Soviet Union invaded Poland, so Russia is now reviving the Soviet Union. I don't really see it that way. The way I see it is that Russia is reviving Tsardom. That's how I see it. Because pure communism is a hatred against religion, right? A, a part of communism is not just the control of the means of production. Pure communism is also removing all religion, outlawing all religion. This is why at one point in time, the church was outlawed uh, in Russia until Stalin allowed freedom for the church in order to spark the morale of his soldiers because who the hell wants to die for atheism? Uh but real real communism is removing all religion. Islam, Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, all religion but must be removed. But that's not what's happening in Russia. In Russia, you have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Eastern Orthodox churches throughout the country. Many new churches have been constructed in that country. The church is very close to the state. This is not communism. This is not communism. Yes, there is a lot of reverence for Joseph Stalin in Russia, and that is definitely a problem, and I'm not going to support that, and I'm, not, I'm definitely not going to hide it. But when you look at what is physically taking place, what is actually transpiring in Russia, what we're seeing is Tsardom. Because in Tsardom, you had the state, but you also had the very influential Eastern Orthodox Church. This is not communism. Now, in Ukraine you have a, 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 a very strong political cult that reveres these, these uh, very uh, violent political ideologues of the first half of the 20th century. We're talking the UPA, the OUN, and I've said these names before. I'll keep saying them. Stepan Bandera, um, uh, Andrei Melnik, uh, and numerous others. And, and uh, Ukraine still denies the massacre that the OUN did on the Polish people. So we have to take all these things into consideration. Morawiecki doesn't say, hey, the demon of Banderism is still alive in Ukraine. He never says this, because his whole the whole point of his article is to make war on Russia. And he says here, when I speak to young people, the history of the 20th century sounds to them like a grisly fairy tale. And this is very true. When you look at what was happening in the first half of the 20th century with the wiping out of entire villages, the butchering of millions of people. I mean, you read about Nanking, not, not just Europe. I mean, like, like the horrors of, of the first half of the 20th century didn't take place in, just in Europe. It took place also in Asia. And you read about the invasion of Nanking and how the Japanese butchered so many millions of people in China and other parts of Asia and the, this, the, the endless amounts of rapes and sadistic murders that were happening on the part of the Japanese military, it was absolutely horrific. And so a lot of people read this stuff or they hear about these things, and, and a lot of people think, man, this, this could not have happened. But it did happen. So that's I agree with Morawiecki here where he says it's like a fairy tale. It's true. Uh, he says here, it seems impossible that Hitler or Stalin could return in our time. 
Yeah, and I and I totally understand the implication. His implication is that no one today thinks that a Stalin or a Hitler could come back. And that is true. People don't think that Hit, a Hitler or a Stalin could ever come back. Uh, I believe most certainly that an, a, another Hitler could come back. I truly believe that. I could totally see another Hitler coming back uh, from coming back in Europe. Totally see it with the revival of, of uh, reactionaryism, populism, um, the the entry of of fanatical parties that would have been considered mainstream uh, that would have been considered fringe ten years ago into into mainstream politics and how parties like the AFD or like the the Forum for Democracy party in the Netherlands uh, or the Freedom Party how these parties have become have entered mainstream politics really goes to show that yes these things are coming back uh, these things reaction reactionaryism and all these things uh, I could totally see it happening uh, he goes on to say, uh, however, the illusion that history cannot repeat itself was laid bare on February 24th this year. Of course, he's talking about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The inconceivable became fact when rockets fell on Kiev, Kharkiv, and other cities of a sovereign democratic state. Now, I wouldn't go so far as to say Putin is a Stalin, or we have no evidence that Russia is systematically butchering millions of people. There's no evidence of this. Um, have Russian soldiers done bad things? Sure, yes. But I don't see any evidence of a systematic uh, extermination of a people that's coming from actual governmental policy in Moscow. I'm just not seeing it. Um, but he, he goes on to say the inconceivable. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but in the end, he says, just as Germany was once subject to denazification, today the only chance for Russia... And the civilized world is de-Putinization. Again, I don't know. I don't see how that's ever possible without a war with Russia. Like, yes, there was a denazification of Germany, but that didn't come about from, you know, propaganda movies in Germany. That didn't come about from America sending anti-Nazi films to to Germany. Like that. that that's not how it happened. The only way that that denazification took place was. From through a war, there was a war, and then there was denazification. It's kind of like how the Spanish Empire detonated <laughs> the Aztec Empire. You know, it was like it wasn't just okay. Let's just send Bibles to the Aztec Empire. It was okay. There was a war. Spain invaded Mexico. They destroyed the Aztec Empire. Okay, now let's let's remove paganism from the country. Like you can't remove the ideology of of uh russian world or or uh the idea of reviving the russian empire in russia without having a war and defeating russia and if you were to do that i mean P P poland would be ravished like in a war there's no doubt in my mind and it would just bring about an absolute disaster germany would revive um uh so many millions of people would die it would just be an utter nightmare and then and then because you would be in the middle of a world war i mean all these nationalists in ukraine would be like why not let's just go rape and kill a bunch of people and they might just just go right past the border and kill them a whole bunch of polish civilians all sorts of horrors could happen in in such a in such a situation now um Marowiecki is right when he says that they are demons in ukraine but these demons are coming from western ukraine uh, yes, they are evil Russian soldiers, but he's not mention, mentioning the demons in Ukraine, especially in Western Ukraine. Uh, there was a French soldier, or a former French soldier, by the name of Adrian Boquet, and he uh, went to Ukraine uh, to do a humanitarian mission. And he came back, and he talked about what he saw. And this is what he said in a recent interview. He said, uh, Azov fighters are everywhere, with neo-Nazi stripes. It shocks me that Europe is supplying weapons to neo-Nazis. On their uniforms, SS symbols are embroidered everywhere. Not only do they hide their views, they advertise them. I worked with these people and treated them. They openly say that they are ready to destroy blacks and Jews. <sighs> now, it's amazing that uh, the Prime Minister of Poland failed to mention the demon of Banderitism, and it's right next door. Because if you look at the statistics when it comes to the popularity of uh, hardcore uh, Ukrainian nationalism, it's pretty much all concentrated in Western Ukraine 
and also central Ukraine, but more so western Ukraine, which is right on the border with Poland. And so it surprises me that the Polish prime minister um, didn't mention this at all and hasn't really been talking about this at all unless I haven't heard about that. And, you know, if, if he did, then let me know. There is a stark contrast between rhetoric uh, coming out of Poland now uh, from rhetoric that was coming from Poland uh, four, five, even ten years ago in regards to Ukrainian nationalism. Um, because it is very serious. There is still a cult of Bandera in Poland, in uh, Ukraine, Poland. There is still a cult of Bandera in Ukraine. There is still a cult of the OUN and the UPA in Ukraine. There is still a denial of the atrocities that they committed against uh, Polish people. And this needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed. If you're going to be giving Ukraine weapons, if you're going to be supporting uh, Ukraine with military aid, uh, you should be concerned about who's getting those weapons. You should be concerned about the rise of an ideology that denies that uh, any massacre was done against uh, the Polish people. This would be like um, this would be like if Israel gave a whole bunch of weapons to some Muslim country and that Muslim country hated Jews. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot. Israel did do that back in the 1980s uh, when it sold a whole bunch of weapons to Iran. Now, um, it's very, very weird. And I saw this today and I couldn't, I, when I first read it, I couldn't believe it. I thought, is this Russian propaganda? I, I just couldn't believe it. So I, I did some more research and I saw that Reuters reported this and I'm like, it's real. Just when I thought that Pope Francis could not get any lower... Uh, he did. <laughs> he uh, he met with the wives of Nazi uh, Ukrainian Nazi fighters, Ukrainian uh, ultra nationalist fighters, uh, Azov fighters. I, I couldn't believe it, but yeah, he did. This is a, a quote from an article that was published by a, a, a publication called Kant, and it says here at a meeting with the pontiff, the women asked the head of the Vatican to persuade Russian President Vladimir Putin to release their husbands. He meets with, he could have met with anybody. He could have met with anybody from Ukraine. He could have met with just like normal Ukrainian civilians. But he had to meet the wives of Azov Battalion fighters. Now, I don't know if Francis knew who these women were, who their husbands are. I'm not sure if he knows about Azov. It's possible that he was just told by whoever is in charge of him, the people who are really who are really in charge of the Vatican. It's possible that they told him, "Okay, uh, Papa, you're gonna go over there. You're gonna meet the wives of the Nazis. Okay, you're gonna meet the wives of the Nazis, and you're gonna go. You're gonna do it as I, as I say. Okay, very good. Okay, go do that now, because it seems to me that this that this uh, Pope is just controlled. But it's a reflection of something. It's a reflection of the West. What do you mean? It's a reflection of the West. I mean, there seems to be a pattern here of supporting fascists and supporting fascism. Uh, you can go all the way to the Cold War, and you will see that the Cold War was riddled with these little operations of backing up uh, neo-Nazi and ultra-nationalist paramilitary groups in, in Europe um, or in, in Central America. And... Uh, it reminds me of, of something. Um, it reminds me of Mikola Lebed. This just came to my mind. Mikola Lebed was the true orchestrator for the massacre of the Poles in Volinia and in East Galicia. You see, Bandera, Stepan Bandera was evil, right? He was involved in the assassin, assassination of a Polish uh, official. He wanted to remove all of the Polish uh, leadership in uh, Volinia and in East Galicia and in Lvov. He wanted to remove all of the Polish academics. Uh, he wanted to destroy all of the leadership and the academics. Um, but I couldn't find, and if somebody could help me with this, I could not find any quote from Bandera directly ordering the massacre of Polish civilians. I find a quote from Bandera 
I found a, a statement on an order from the OUN on uh, on uh, to uh, remove or to destroy the leadership and the academics, which would imply killing Polish leaders and academics. But I couldn't find anything from Bandera saying, go out and kill every Pole you see. Does that mean he didn't do it or he didn't want that? No, it's possible that he, it's it's more than likely that he did want the slaughter of all of those uh, Polish people because um, a lot of these uh, leaders who, who orchestrated massacres, they would not directly order massacres because they didn't want anything attributed to them. Um, but Bandera was definitely evil. He was with, he was uh, the leader of the OUN or one of the leaders of the OUN he, alongside Andrei Melnik, made an alliance with the Third Reich. He wanted to remove all of the Poles um, from uh, from uh, East Galicia, from Lvov, uh, Volinia. Um, he wanted to remove the academics and the leaders and any Polish person who refused to Ukrainianize. He wanted to remove all Polish culture. So he wanted genocide. He, he wanted ethnic cleansing. Like, there's no doubt about it. He was evil. He was very evil. But Mikola Lebed is a little bit different in the sense that we have direct evidence showing that Lebed wanted the slaughter of all Poles in Volinia. This is why some Polish person uh, told me, uh, wrote a comment in one of my videos uh, a couple of months ago saying that, or it was about a month and a half ago, that Lebed was the guy who orchestrated the slaughter. I looked into this and yeah, it's true. Melnik, of course, was involved, but Lebed was a guy who directly ordered the s wholesale slaughter of Polish civilians. And whatever happened to Mikola Lebed, this butcher, this massacrer, whatever happened to this guy? He died in a peaceful retirement in the east coast of the United States. In fact, you can find his gravestone in New Jersey. Why was a mass murderer allowed to enter the U.S. and live a peaceful, calm, tranquil uh, retirement? The reason is because the United States wanted to use Mikola Lebed to promote anti-Russian propaganda amongst the uh, ethnic Ukrainians living in the United States. And he was also doing, I believe, the same thing in Canada, because a lot of the Ukrainians moved to Canada after the Second World War. So that really goes to show, it's, it's a reflection of something, that in the West there is this pattern of using fascist and supporting fascist. And it's, they, they see it as a means to an end. Anything to destroy Russia. If America had to support radical left-wing militants to go against Russia, America would do it. They don't care who these people have murdered. They don't care how many people they've raped. They don't care. So it's the same thing with the Vatican. I'm not saying the Pope woke up and said, I want to be with the wives of Nazis. But the Pope hang, hung out with these people. And what that it's really a reflection of the institution of the Vatican itself. I think this Pope is controlled. I don't think he was in charge of this. But I think somebody in the Vatican said, let's, let's help Azov. Let's help Ukraine. Because it's part of NATO policy. And it's almost as if the Vatican will follow NATO policy. Not all the time. I mean, the Vatican was against the Iraq War. But in certain instances, you see this sort of thing. In fact, there were members of the Catholic clergy who were uh, even supporters of uh, the slaughter of, of, uh, of uh, Serbs by the Eustasha. It's very sad. Um, now, going back to Morawiecki's statement about demons in Ukraine, the ultranationalism has quadrupled in Ukraine. There was, and, and this is not from Russian, uh, Russian media. This is from Polish publications. I s searched through the Polish internet today, uh, and I found some articles here. And this is an article, it's from a Polish publication called Kresy. It's from May 5th. 2022, so very recent, which really goes to show you that there are people in Poland who recognize this dangerous reality. 
And this article says that the rating group, rating group is a study group in Poland. It says, the, or in Ukraine, I don't know, but it's a study group. And it says the rating group emphasizes that this year's survey showed a clear increase in the positive attitude towards the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, OUN, and the Ukrainian insurgent army, UPA. The percentage of Ukrainians who consider members of the OUN UPA to be uh, participants in the fight for Ukraine's state independence has increased significantly. Since 2010, the scale of support for the OUN UPA has quadrupled. The greatest number of supporters uh, of recognizing the UPA as participants in the fight for Ukraine's independence was recorded in the West, 89%. So 89% of those surveyed in Western Ukraine have a favorable view to towards the UPA and the OUM. And in the center of the country, 82%. 71% have a positive attitude towards UPA soldiers. Surveyed Ukrainians, of which 40% unequivocally positive. So, um, yeah, 71% had this positive view, and of that, uh, 40% uh, have an unequivocal positive attitude, if I'm reading this correctly. It is most visible in Western Ukraine, 86% positive, including 60% definitely, and the central part of the country, 75%, including 41%, definitely. The least support was recorded in the east and south of Ukraine, obviously. Why? Those were those are where most of the pro-Russia people are. But even there, the positive ratings are clearly above 40%. The largest number of people criticizing the OUN UPA are recorded in the east, 28%, 17% by far. And here's a report from another uh, Polish publication. It's called Pravi. And it says, Bandera and the OUN UPA for many years in Ukraine were, apart from narrow circles, forgotten. Recently, however, the cult of this organization responsible for the brutal murder of Poles has been revived, and the Russian invasion has made support for it even higher. And this is true. The Russian in invasion of Ukraine has given more of a reason for these Ukrainian nationalists to exist. Is that the fault of Russia? No, it's not. Because what the Russian invasion has done is simply exposed something deep in the heart of, or really in the soul of Ukraine. It's exposed something. Just like the war in Iraq exposed something evil in the Middle East. It exposed the reality of Islamic fundamentalism, albeit America did support Islamic fundamentalists, and that was evil. But regardless of that, um, it exposed Islamic fundamentalism. Exposed that, yes, there has been a Islamic fundamentalist problem in the Middle East for quite some time. Now, I've gotten a lot of comments from Polish people, mostly negative, angry at me, saying that I'm wrong for whatever, blah, 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 blah. Uh, because I said that Poland, if given the opportunity, would take Western Ukraine, and I still hold to that position. But in all fairness, I did get a number of Polish supporters or Polish people expressing agreement with what I said. And the latest one is from a woman named Polina Noliszewska. And she says, Theodore, young Poles derive their knowledge from media propaganda and do not want to learn history. I know this because I and my husband are history teachers. It's a lost generation, unfortunately. Also, a lot of Ukrainians write biased comments, I believe. Thank you for reminding uh, us of a bit of a difficult story. It's amazing. That I, I remember four years ago talking about this stuff. I remember, you know, years ago talking about this stuff and so many Polish people saying, yes, yes, you know, you, you know we will never forget this. And yes, you, uh, uh, Ukraine did do this, et cetera, et cetera. And now when you talk about it, you have these Polish people coming out with a different form of rhetoric, which leads, which leads me to, to suspect that these Polish people are Zoomers. Or maybe they're uh, maybe they have the minds of Zoomers. I don't know, but it's very disturbing to see Polish people talk this way when the reality is that you have a very dangerous ideology right across from your border, right across your border, on the other side of your border with Ukraine, and those people deny that Volinia even happened. They deny the massacres. They still support those who orchestrated the massacres. They say the UPA was great. They say the OUN was great. And that is scary. That is very scary. 
Anyway, you guys just heard some Theo Logi. God bless. Thank you.